But it is uh, such an honor and a privilege to be here today. And the message today that I wish to, uh, to kind of unpack as we're going to looking in the text, we're going to be in a few different passages of scriptures, but primarily we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Uh, and the, the title of this message is The Faithful Church. You know, unless your head has been in the sand for the last few years, there has been an increasing amount of attacks on the church. There has been a lot of stuff happening within the church in which people have been leaving the church, uh, prominent figures and leaders within the church falling away, churches closing up shop. I mean, we had the pandemic, we had all this stuff, and the question that I've been getting a lot from young adults and even some other individuals within our church is, what is the status of the church? Is the church healthy and thriving? Uh, what's the future looking like if, if Christianity starts to get bogged down and uh, you know, political pressures start happening? What if we lose our 501c status? What if it's all these what ifs, what ifs, what ifs? And I think when we go back to the text and, and we look at church history and we see kind of what the church has been through, I think it can really give us some confidence, some assurity in that God is preserving his people, his bride, and that we can have confidence in that. But at the same time, this is a message of just a, of warning for all of us in the church, myself included, to let's make sure that we are a faithful church. Let's just make sure that we are staying consistent with God's word. And I've got three points, but if you will, let's look at the text. Uh, I'll be reading from the ESV version. It'll be up on the screen uh, if you don't have it. But Ephesians 5, verses 6 through 10. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Now this text really opens us up, and this is in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, and this is the Apostle Paul writing this to the church in Ephesus at the same time while he's under house arrest in Rome. Uh, this is one of uh, his epistles that he is encouraging and equipping the church. And what's interesting is as he gets to this section in the chapter of uh, Ephesians chapter 5, he has already kind of given them qualifications of this is Christianity, this is what we are doing. And we get into this spot, and he gives a warning. And now, if you've read Paul, if you've studied Paul, all of his letters really have a dualistic purpose. One, it's addressing either individuals or churches. And at the same time, it is also throwing up a cautionary flag and a warning of be aware of false teachers. You have to be cautious. And he gives us some beautiful illustrations here. Now, the reason why I bring this up is I want to talk about the church in Ephesus that Paul is writing. Now, here's some quick background. If you're not sure about the church in Ephesus, when it started, it's kind of geographical location. You've already been through the book of Revelation, so you've seen that section in Revelation chapter 2 being addressed to the church in Ephesus. But Paul's writing this, as I said, from Rome, under house arrest, to the church in Ephesus around 62 AD. Now, why, is that, why does that matter? I'm going to get to that here in a second. Now, Ephesus was in Asia Minor, and it was steeped in paganism. And that would have been an incredibly difficult location to minister the gospel. So I'm saying this point here because I want us to see that a lot of times in our life, in our culture, we think, man, it has never been as bad as it is right now. Man, it seems as if, man, we are on the precipice of a complete failure or as the church is going to get just crushed with the future in that's happening. Well, let's go back and let's see what on earth has happened in the past even within the first century. So the church in Ephesus was a very steeped in paganism area, and the main, place, the main place of worship was the Temple of Artemis. And this was built out of marble, and it was the size of a full city block. So imagine a church the size of a full city block. Actually, I, I work at one, so you can see exactly uh, what that is. But this was not a Bible-based church, this was a paganist church, and this is where the sacred goddess Diana was to be worshipped in the ancient Greco-Roman world. Now, here's the thing. Here's what I want to look at. This place was so steeped in paganism and anti-biblical truths. The temple had thousands of priests, temple prostitutes, musicians, dancers, 
and other pagan worshipers steeped in self-mutilation, drunkenness, and other horrific acts. This does not seem like a place uh, where you want to raise a family. This does not seem like a place in which the, the church will, will spread and will grow. It seems very hostile towards the gospel. So much so that a Greek philosopher says in the 5th century BC, the Ephesians deserve to be hanged, every last one of them, due to their spiritual darkness and corruption. Now here's the interesting thing about this. Does the gospel care what the cultural climate is? No, it does not. In fact, the gospel thrives in the most deep, dark areas because the word of God has that power to bring out that light in that darkness, to show individuals the problems and to show and point them to Jesus. And so this area in Ephesus, Ephesus, if I was to be a church planner and they say, Ethan, where do you want to go? Ephesus is probably not where my first choice would be. I have three kids. I don't know if I would want to raise my three kids with the temple of Diana right there. Even though my wife's name is Diana, it would not be a temple to her. I just would not want to have my children raised in this deep, drunken, horrific area. But guess what happens? That's exactly where a church is planted. And I want us to look at the first principle of a faithful church. The first principle is the church is faithful to be a light in dark places. Was Ephesus dark? Absolutely. Ephesus was probably as about as dark as you can get. And the gospel first came to Ephesus by two individuals accompanying Paul, Priscilla and Aquila. They were a husband and wife, and you can find their story in Acts chapter 18, verse 18. And it says this in Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow and they came to Ephesus and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with him. Now, if you look forward after Acts chapter 18, verse 18 into verse 24, we get more context as to how this church started. Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus and he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. When you see the word scriptures here, this is a reference to the Old Testament scriptures, obviously, because the New Testament was still in writing. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent, this is key here, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately, what? The things concerning Jesus, though he only knew of the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now I bring this up because I want to show you that this church was planted by two individuals, and then God had sent an additional third individual, Apollos, to plant this church in the heart of a deep and pagan area. But here's the question. How did a church grow among all of the evil and among all of the horrific culture that was happening? Well, Acts chapter 19, and if you have your Bibles, I think it'll be up on the screen. Acts chapter 19, 8 through 10, demonstrates to us how can a church be a light in a dark place? How can a church grow numerically and grow spiritually in this form and in this area. So in Acts chapter 19, we see this in verses 8 through 10. And he, this is Paul, and he entered the synagogue and for three months, look at this, spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way, the way they're being referencing back to Jesus, before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now let me explain the significance of this section right here and the significance of why Paul was writing this in Ephesians 5, 6 through 10 and the whole birth of the church in Ephesus at this time. This church started not just in a corrupt, evil area, but in a corrupt and evil governance time as well. This timeline, when this was happening, the church in Ephesus was around 53 to 56 AD, where if you've heard of Emperor Nero, I'm assuming most of you have heard of Emperor Nero, this was when he was just coming into power and the church was about to be completely ravaged. Now, what's interesting though, as this church was planted, this church exploded and became the central sending hub of all of the other churches in that surrounding area, moving the light of the gospel into all these dark regions and penetrating the culture, penetrating the individuals, and the church was growing and the church was exploding because the church was being a light in a dark and corrupt and perverse generation in a perverse city. And this continued for two years. 
Paul was with them for two years. And the text says in Acts 19.10, all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Do you think even all the residents of Gulf Breeze and Pensacola has heard the gospel? Have they heard the name of Jesus? Do they know who he is? Yes, we're in the South, and yes, we're in the Bible Belt, and everyone likes to claim that they're Christian, but have they actually heard what it actually is that the Bible says? Do we as Christians actually tell them what it says? Are we, as Paul is indicating here in Acts, are we reasoning with them? Are we contending for the faith? Are we going out there and answering these questions, these difficult issues that everyone is wrestling with? That everyone is not sure, well, what is truth? Is truth objective? What, what are we looking at here? Now, here's what's awesome about this. How did they teach the word of God? Because the church grew, because the people of the church rooted themselves in the teachings of Jesus, and it was centralized around one thing, the word of God. The church can be a light in a dark place when we centralize our teaching around the word of God. And notice how they did this. In Acts 18, verse 25, they did it accurately, right? They did it accurately. In Acts chapter 19, verse 8, they did it boldly. That word boldly means communicating in a way of confidence from assurance of belief. So they didn't just say that they were Christians. They boldly explained what it is to be a Christian. They knew what was inside, and they had the confidence to step out to be able to proclaim exactly who Jesus is and what he has done in their life and what he can do for their life. And then the next qualifier we see in Acts chapter 19, verse 8, reasoning. Now that word reasoning, I don't know if I got any lawyers in here or anyone who likes to debate. I know my kids from time to time when it comes to bedtime, they enjoy debating on how they can stay up later for water and then the water is just never ending. When you see the word reasoning here, this is not a debate. The word reasoning here is, when you look at the definition and the breakdown in the Greek, it's to make friends with and persuading a person towards faith. So what this is saying here is that when you're accurately teaching the word of God, you do this in a bold manner and you do this as you reason with them. As you see constantly throughout the book of Acts, Paul reasoned with them in the synagogues as was his custom. Paul reasoned with them. What does that mean? Did Paul just walk in there and say, all right, guys, I got the stuff. Come here. You need to listen to me. Sit and take notes, boys. I've got it for you. No, that's not what he did. He went, as Acts 17 says, he went into the marketplace and he reasoned with them. He built relationships with them. He connected with them, but he didn't just connect with them on a friendship level. He engaged with them on a friendship level and then he transitions them from where they're at and takes them and points them to Jesus and he points them to the truth. And when the church is surrounding and is centralized around the word of God, the church will be a light in a dark, dark place. Because what's interesting here. And I say this, not against Coastline, not against any church. I'm saying this as a warning to the universal church around the globe. When the church is acting like the church and preaches the whole counsel of God, the church will automatically be a light in the area in which they are serving. The church doesn't need an extra outreach program. The church doesn't need another this or this or this to how can we engage the community. When the church preaches the whole counsel of God accurately, the church will by default stand in a complete difference than the rest of the culture that they are around. Now, why do I think this? Why do I say this? Where's your scriptural support, Ethan? Fantastic question. You guys ask great questions. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Look at Matthew chapter 5. And let's look at verses 14 to 16. Matthew 5, 14, 16. And for many of you, this is going to sound very familiar. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. Oh, you hear that? You are the light of the world. Same kind of language Paul is using in Ephesians 5. You are the light of the world. A city, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do a people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, church, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, church, this is the second point that we can take out of this text. The church is number one, to be a light in dark places. But number two, the church must, must remain faithful to the word of God. I was a part of a, uh, a theological society in which we are discussing about revisioning the 1978 Chicago Inerrancy Statement of Faith 
of the scriptures. If you have no idea what that is, don't worry, you're in good company. What this was, was in 1978, there was a battle for the Bible. That the Bible was either the inspired, infallible, authoritative word of God, or it was not. And so as the culture has continued to come, a lot of the scholars have gotten together and say, we need to make further revisions to ensure we have a very clear, distinct statement about the authority and the inerrancy of Scripture. Because the attacks on Christianity I have seen come in three major categories. One, the Word of God and the authority of Scripture. Two, the Trinity of the Godhead. And then three, the divinity of Jesus. When a church compromises on one of those things, it's a matter of time before that church is going to die, shut the doors, and be done. And we see that happening all around the globe, sadly, right now. But in other areas in which there's intense persecution, they don't have all the time to be worried about all these materialistic things. And they just sit down and they buckle down and they read the Word of God. The church in the Ukraine right now, I mean, this has been going on for quite some time, is still flourishing. They're not sitting there thinking, well, I don't like the way that Cindy said the word Jesus, so let's cast her out of the church. We ain't got time for that. Life is short. Let's get back to the word of God. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the church is to remain faithful to the word of God. Look back at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6. And here's the reasoning why. Let no one deceive you with empty words. <laughs> this is so key. You cannot be deceived with empty words. And right now, with social media, with everything else that we have, there is a ton of empty words all across the place. Amen. There is heresies coming back from the second century that I read back in seminary thinking, well, oh, that's absurd, no one believes that. And now I have people saying, hey, Ethan, what do you think about docetism? I'm like, Where did you dig that thing up at, guy? And say, oh, well, I saw this TikToker guy, and he said that this is this and this. And this is coming out everywhere. And it is empty words. And Paul is writing this to the church in Ephesus saying, guys, church, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, remain faithful against false teachers and false preachers. Why? Look at verse 7 and 8. Look at this. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, I think this right here is key, therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you're in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So look at this. Paul's reemphasizing where they once were. Where were they once? In darkness. But now where are they? Now they're in the light. And this is referencing back to what Jesus said in Matthew 5.14 about being a light. Well, how does the church remain faithful? Well, we've already talked about we are light, but now we are saying we need to be faithful to the Word of God. The church is to remain faithful by faithfully following, teaching, obeying, and studying the Word of God. And that's not just for the pastors, that's for every single person that considers himself a Christian, that is a member of a church, or that attends a church body. That's not just for a few elite and then it's, everything trickles down from there where you guys don't need to read. Let it come from the top down. That's what the whole Reformation brought about back in the 15th, 16th century because that's how the Catholic Church was pushing everything. We have to faithfully follow, teach, and obey and study the Word of God. We have the whole counsel of God in the Scriptures and we can learn from our lineage, we can learn from our history, church history, what can happen if we lose that grasp and we lose that sight of what our actual purpose is? And here's a warning that I have for all of us today. We as the people of the church have the tendency to revert back to our old pattern of living, our old pattern of thinking. And this is an item of significant importance because look at what sadly happens to the church at Ephesus despite Paul's warnings. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to preach from Revelation 2. I'm going to finish up your whole series in Revelation here in a second. So Neil can thank me later. No. Revelation chapter 2. And look at verse 4. This is sad. Because Paul's giving this warning in Ephesians chapter 5 of don't be deceived with empty words. Don't abandon your love. Don't, don't let these people into your midst. And what happens? Well, gee whiz. Revelation chapter 2 verse 4. This is God speaking directly to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos as he has given this vision, and he has given this word, and this is a letter being addressed to the church in Ephesus. Verse 4 of Revelation 2. 
But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Could you imagine being the receiving end of this letter in Ephesus that was started by the Apostle Paul that had this incredible lineage of Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos? You're like, oh man, like we are good, guys. Our church is booming. We've sent out 1,700 missionaries. We've planted 55,000 different churches. And all of a sudden you get this letter from John. You're like, holy smokes, this guy's still alive? And it's calling you out. You've abandoned your first love. This is a cry for the church to come back, for a reformation of the church. That is what this is. Because as John is writing this, not just to the church in Ephesus, but to the other seven churches, I want us to think about this. Only four decades of time have passed since Paul was there. How much time does it take for the church to lose its focus? I say way less than that. When you've got an individual that is in the pulpit and when you have a church that is not centralized around the word of God, it can take months to a year because people will start, true regenerate believers will start pouring out of that church saying, this, I want nothing to do with this. This is not preaching the whole counsel of God. And what is happening here is this is a stark warning that only four decades have passed since Paul was at Ephesus and John writes this letter. And the love and passion that the church once had has become dull, calloused, and something more so they have become stagnant as a body. That light that they were supposed to be has become a very dim, dim light. Because the driving force to kick that fire going is the word of God, and they've neglected their first love. They've neglected what they first hood. Now here's the, here's the issue that I have seen in how the modern church have, from my perspective, has been doing this. The church has become a mechanical and pragmatic in their devotion to Christ and has begun to lose the love they first loved. Let me say that again. If you're not sure what this means, I'm going to unpack it. The church has become mechanical and pragmatic in their devotion to Christ. What I mean by mechanical and pragmatic? That if I take this structure and this system, put it into this context, out will come the results. It's as if it's, you know, if you've ever ground meat or anything else like that, you put a, you know, a stick of meat in there, you grind it, and out comes shredded beef. Or ground beef, not shredded beef. That'd be weird. Out comes ground beef. We as a church have become, if you do A, B, and C, D is the result. You know, especially within the young adults ministry, there are so many books, there's so much things out there. You need to grow your college ministry. How? You guys need to be doing jello kickball contests. If you do jello kickball contests, you are, attract the, the freshmen of that college. Well, whatever I attract these individuals with is what I will have to keep them with. And if I'm attracting people with jello kickball contests, I've got to continually be this symbol clanging monkey. And what am I not doing is being focused and centralized on the word of God. And that's not just in the young adult context that I find myself in. That's in the context of the entire church. And there's a stark warning here too. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 14 through 15, this is interesting. Look at this. And your renown, this is... God speaking to Israel, and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I bestowed on you, declares the Lord. So this section right here is talking about the golden age of Israel, in which Israel is just, man, we are in our prime, baby. This is it. And I would say for Christianity, that was probably the Jesus movement era. I was like, man, this is the golden age. We see so many people come into Christ. This is awesome. And then what, what has been happening since then? People have been walking away, walking away. It's like, oh my goodness, what's happening? What's happening? Like, we need to get this back. We need to get this back. This is what the warning is to the Israelites. Why did this happen? Because they trusted in their beauty and played the whore because of their renown lavished on your whorings. On any passerby, your beauty became his. So the message to the church in Ephesus and the message to Israel is clear. You do not need to grow weary in doing good. You do not need to abandon what you know to be true when life gets tough. Turn back to Christ. Do not neglect what you are called into. Do not neglect the word of God. Within the past few years, the church, I mean, it's, it's since 2019, the church has been refined by God during the pandemic, during political turmoil, and high-level evangelicals becoming compromised by the culture. This is God purging the wheat from the chaff. 
I'm not saying everybody that left church because of COVID. I'm not saying all that, but what I'm saying is the church, if you haven't noticed it, we are being refined by God. We are being refined in our growth. We are being refined as a body. And what we have to understand is we have to continually place our hope in the work of Christ and what he has done for us through the word of God. And we must be cautious as believers of the body to self-reflect on what motivates us. What is our desires for being here? And what is our behavior like? Because the stark warning that we get also from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must play, pay much closer attention. What? What should we have paid much closer attention to? To what we have heard, lest what? We drift away from it. Well, how do we present and prevent ourselves from drifting away from our first love? How do we prevent ourselves from being misaligned and influenced by these individuals with empty talk and aligning ourselves with those outside the body? It's going back to the source of truth for the Christian, the Word of God. And the Word of God has to be the central point in our life as believers and in the central focus in the life of the church. Everything about what we do at church should be flowing out of Scripture or pointing people back into Scripture. And look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God. So this is talking about the authority of Scripture. All of this is breathed out by God. So let me give you a quick apologetic. People say, well, the Bible doesn't claim to be the Word of God. Uh, yes, it does. Bang, right here. So jot that down in your checkbook. All Scripture is breathed out by God. And what can it do? What can Scripture do? Well, it's profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for correction. How? And for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God, don't worry, man or woman, that word is Adelphi, it means believer, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for what? Every good work. Now, I'm going to break this down here real quick. So when you look at the word profitable, aphilimos, it means helpful, serviceable, advantageous. So the word of God is helpful, it's serviceable, and it's advantageous in the life of the believer, in the life of the church. The Bible teaches us. It teaches us all things. This is what we should be teaching our children in. This is what we should be teaching ourselves in. This is what we should be teaching our spouses in. It also gives us reproof, right? It, reproof is very close to correction. Reproof is telling us in being a cautionary filter tale of what it is that we are consuming and what it is that we are engaging ourselves in. It gives us correction. When I'm out of line, it gives me correction. I'm like, I probably shouldn't be doing that. But the biggest thing here, all of these things, if you filter this through what we as individuals within the modern cultural context are consuming, whatever it is that I am listening to, this has to be running through your mind. And you need to be comparing and contrasting every single thing that you hear when anyone ever takes an, an authoritative, objective stance on God's word, you have to have a filter and your mind up and be paying attention. Why? So that you do not go back to what Paul is saying in Ephesians 5 of listening to empty talk and deceit. Because if you've ever been scammed, you don't have to raise your hand. I don't know how many of you have answered the car warranty and said, yes, I actually could use that car warranty, only for you to find out later there was actually no warranty to be had in your car. They did not have secret information about it breaking down as much as they may think you had. It's very easily to be influenced when you don't have your filters up. When you don't have that hedge of protection for the Christian, the hedge of protection is the word of God. Now we think about this, and I am saying the church must be faithful to the word of God. And you may be thinking, well, of course, Ethan. What's the point? I don't really think that's an issue. I beg to differ. A survey that Ligonier Ministries has done had this statement and asked Christian evangelicals. Just think about that, that Christian evangelicals. So we've got it. This is the question that they asked, the statement. And they asked do you agree with this or not? The Bible is 100% accurate in all that it teaches. 29% of evangelicals strongly disagree with this statement. Whereas, 29% just agree. Should that azimuth not have been a 100% strongly agree? Amen. If, if we don't think that the Bible is the authoritative word of God and is 100% accurate, then what on earth are we doing? As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we're the most to be pitied, right? Amen. Like Amen. what on earth are we doing here, ladies and gentlemen? And so that statement just shows us that we've got to be cautious. 
We must revitalize our love of Scripture in every aspect of our life. And we need to get to the third point here. The faithful church discerns. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10. This is Paul saying, And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness. But what should we do? What should the church do in there's unfruitful works of darkness? Expose them. If there's something happening in your life, if there's something happening in this church, don't sweep this under the rug and cover it up and step on and be like, nothing's wrong here. What I don't see, and granted, I don't think any pastor would do this because they're going to be looking for a new church very soon, is when was the last time we as pastors have called the church as a group to repent? When was the last time you as an individual has openly repented? And not just that. When was the last time we've had church discipline? Again, I'm not poking and prodding into things, but we've got to see that the church must be preserved and we must keep a high standard of what occurs in here. The instructions have. We cannot let the darkness enter in. Instead, we must expose them, expose them as a church and expose them in our own lives. The culture attempts to tell the church what it can and cannot do. The church tries to tell, or excuse me, the culture tries to tell us what is right and wrong. We must not allow ourselves as a church and as Christians to be influenced by the culture. Instead, we, the church, must influence the culture. That is what being light and darkness is. Instead of the church being influenced and attacked and infiltrated by the culture and that darkness, and trust me, it's much easier for us to get pulled down into the darkness than it is for us to pull them into the light, right? We have to be cautious about that. But sadly, there's no shortage of teachers, preachers, and influencers and other entities attempting to distort, manipulate the word of God, and influence the church. That is why we have to go back to point number two and maintain a faithful, true understanding of the word of God. Paul gives the church at Ephesus the standard for discernment. Try to discern what, how, and what should we be filtering through? What is pleasing to the Lord? The word pleasing means fully acceptable and agreeable. It's not one of those... Well, I think Jesus is okay with that. You know, I, that's okay. No, it's like, no, that's pretty black and white. He does not want me to do that. What is pleasing to the Lord? Because everything that we do, everything in how we should be acting, we are doing it not for ourselves. We're not doing it for each other, but we are doing it for the Lord. What is man's purpose? To glorify God and give praise to him and enjoy a relationship with him forever. We do this by not taking part of the unfruitful works of darkness and when you see that word darkness again in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. That word darkness, this is the word darkness. Because you may be thinking like a physical dark. Darkness means becoming dull and blind to what we should be doing. Think about that. Darkness is becoming dull and blind to what we should be doing. The faithful church is cautious about what they consume and who they allow to speak into them. When the church remains faithful to the word of God, the mission and aim of the church is consistent and persistent. It's not people saying, well, what is your church about? It's obvious. And coming into here at Coastline, it's very obvious what you guys are about. And it's so awesome and it's so encouraging. Do you have faithful men delivering the word of God here at Coastline? And I love that. Because when we have that, it prevents what happens in Ephesians 4.14. So that we may, we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. See, the explosion of the gospel in Ephesus was not because they looked similar to the culture in which they lived. The explosion of the gospel was because the radical difference emanating out of the lives of the church being set apart from the world while they are still living within that world. You want to know how to look different? Be a Christian. Be an actual Christian. Not just a nominal, I'm saying I'm a Christian. I'm talking a legitimate, Bible-believing, not thumping, but Bible-believing Christian. Because as Paul again tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we should not be conformed to this world, but what should we be doing? We must be transformed by the renewer of our mind. Why? So that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And in John chapter 15, verse 19, Jesus gives us this warning that, hey guys, it's not going to be easy. Just actually being an actual Christian is not going to be easy. This is what Jesus says. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, 
but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. This is exactly what was happening and what transpired at the birth of the church in the first century. The world hates the teachings of Jesus. The world hates when you even mention the name of Jesus, depending on where you're at, you will really probably get attacked with that. In Romans 2.15, this is telling us what is happening and why is it that people get so offended when you use the name Jesus. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. See, the first century hated the Christian church at that time because of what and how the church was living and teaching and conducting their lives. Beginning with Nero, and then we had the execution of Paul and Peter and all of the other disciples. Think about what happened in this first century time frame after Jesus ascended into heaven and then up until this point in the church in Ephesus. 60 to 64 AD, Nero burned thousands of towns, villages, and settlements all across Israel. Executed as many Christians as they could possibly get. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Then after Nero, Domitian came and began an even longer campaign against the church from 81 to 96 AD. So why am I saying this? I hear so often from so many Christians, man, we are in a bad place right now. This is not good for us. Okay, and? Well, this is just, it's just not good. So is that taking us off mission? Or does that make us less able to be a Christian in the context in which we're living in? Well, no, Ethan, it's, you know, if America would just repent, I agree. I agree, but America's not in the Bible. I'm sorry. I love this country. I serve this country. I deployed with this country. We don't need a reformation of America, even though we do. We need a reformation of the church, which then by default will then influence America Amen. to start to bring people back to Christ. That's what we need. We don't need anything else. The devil will attempt to subdue us and destroy the church. But guess what happened? At that time in the first century, the church flourished anyway. It doesn't matter. The church gathered or the church scattered. You cannot crush the body of Christ. You can't. This church, all churches around the world, I don't care if we have to go into underground churches. In fact, we would probably be a very healthy people if we did house churches and we didn't have this and we had all this persecution because when you're in combat and when you're in situations like that, your life gets real simple real quick. Amen. Figuring out which box of cereal to purchase and which dish detergent to buy, it's like, I don't care about any of that. This is my mission and this is what I need to focus on. But I'm a realist. I understand we still have all these other responsibilities and things that we have to do, but we must not forget our first love. We must be a faithful church. We must be faithfully be a light in the dark. We must be faithful to the word of God and we must be faithful in discerning what we are doing within these walls and outside of these walls. Scripture provides beautiful words. Learning the, the, the biblical language is gorgeous. In both the Hebrew and the Greek, the words for church are derived from verbs. And here's what it means. The verbs of church and the, the verbs that they use to call together to call together, which indicates a gathering of people who come together for a specific purpose and are mutually united for that same purpose. And that is proclaiming the truths of Scripture and what Jesus has done for us. 